Oh boy, it's going to be one of those shows. Okay, no music today. Hi, uh, welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the Physicians Committee. I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. Appreciate you joining us right here on Facebook and on YouTube. Let's set the table because today's show is going to be a really interesting one. We've got some conventional wisdom that essentially is going to be thrown out the window thanks to some brand spanking new research. We'll be talking about that in just a moment. But also today, we're going to be continuing our discussion about Thanksgiving, making our preparations. That is one week from today. And so yesterday with dietitian Maggie Neola, we got some ideas for recipes. Well, today we're going to get some practical tips from Dr. Vanita Rahman. She is here. She's going to help us with how to keep it healthy overall, how not to overindulge. And, and fall into that dreaded food coma. Dr. Vanita Rahman, thanks so very much for joining us today. Thanks, Chuck. All right, we're going to be talking Thanksgiving in just a little bit. But first, that conventional wisdom that I was just discussing. Recently, I had the opportunity to interview with the queen of science, Dr. Hanna Kaliova. You know, anytime she comes on the show, she's bringing that science so strong. Well, this particular time, we were talking about potatoes and diabetes. You know, for years, people with diabetes, they said, no, I cannot eat those white potatoes. They will send my blood sugar sky high. I got to get them off of my plate. Well, lo and behold, here comes this brand spanking new research that kind of has people thinking, well, maybe potatoes may not be such a bad thing. They looked at it head to head compared to rice. And wouldn't you know, just in time for Thanksgiving, the potato may be the way to go. Here now my conversation with Dr. Hanna Kaliova. Dr. Kaliova, thanks so very much for taking the time. Thank you, Chuck. You know, are, are potatoes good for people with type 2 diabetes? The conventional wisdom is they're not, right? They're high in glycemic index and they should be avoided. Like uh, carbohydrate restriction has been supported. So uh, potatoes are high in carbs and also high in glycemic index. So you better forget potatoes if you're a diabetic. That's the conventional wisdom. And this conventional wisdom has been challenged by a recent study that has just been published in Clinical Nutrition by a research group from Melbourne, Australia. And the researchers were looking into a glycemic response after potato dishes compared to rice. Uh, now, rice um, has been shown to be low in glycemic index. Uh, lower uh, glycemic index lower than 55 is considered low and basmati rice has a glycemic index uh, of 51 uh, so that's considered that's that's considered low uh, and uh, potatoes have a glycemic index of 71 and and anything above 70 is considered high glycemic index uh, so these researchers were looking into the differences in glucose response after a, a, a meal that was containing potatoes prepared in different ways compared with rice. Now, you know, conventional wisdom would be like, why are you even doing the study? <laughs> like, <laughs> rice will be better. <laughs> like, <laughs> why, why even bother? Well, let's see. Uh, so let's look at the study design first. Um, the, the researchers were looking um, at a randomized crossover trial, which means that each participant was re receiving all the meals, uh, four meals in a different order. Uh, 24 people with type 2 diabetes were participating in the study, treated by diet or by metformin, um, the main drug used to treat type 2 diabetes. Uh, and all the study participants uh, received the same standard breakfast that contained 25% of the da daily energy intake, 
a standard lunch that contained 35% of the daily energy intake. And um, they compared four different dinners. Uh, all of them contained the same amount of energy, 40% of energy intake, 50% coming for, from carbohydrate. Now, the four din three dinners contained potatoes uh, prepared in different ways. Uh, the first dish contained uh, boiled potatoes. The second one, roasted potatoes. The third one, uh, boiled potatoes that were cooled down um, and then heated up before the consumption. Um, this preparation has been shown to increase the amount of resistant starch. So like slow down um, the glycemic response after a meal. And uh, then basmati rice. Uh, so let's see uh, what the researchers found out. Uh, first, let's look at the study population. The mean age was 58 years. The mean body mass index was 31.7. That means um, most diabetics were uh, in the obese range. Um, their A1C was 7.3% on average and most of them have had their diabetes for about nine years on average. Now, uh, there was no difference between the meals and the glycemic response two, meal, two hours after the meal, um, which is kind of unexpected. We would, we would expect rice uh, to have the lowest glycemic response two, two hours after the meal. But hey, there was no difference between the meals. Uh, there was a marked difference in insulin secretion, though, uh, being the lowest after rice, which is not a good thing. If you're a diabetic, you, you need to secrete your insulin. Your insulin secretion needs to be high after a meal. Uh, if your insulin secretion is low, that's, uh, you know, that's a part of the problem. So rice was not really helping with insulin secretion. And... Uh, uh, all the potato dishes had a, had a higher insulin uh, secretion than rice, but the potatoes that were cooked and cooled down, um, they had the better uh, insulin response. They had the best insulin response. Now, uh, the researchers were also measuring the 24-hour glucose response using continuous glucose monitoring. And surprisingly, uh, the 24 hour insulin response was the highest after rice. And it was the lowest after roasted potatoes. And most of the difference was coming from the night glucose response, from the nocturnal hours, uh, you know, 10 p.m. at night is here, 7 a.m. is here. So uh, the main difference was that rice was really increasing uh, the glucose levels at night compared to with all the other potato dishes, roasted potatoes being the best. This is the nocturnal or you know the night glucose response specifically being the highest after rice and being lower after all the potato dishes and being the lowest after roasted potatoes. So to summarize the results, there was no um, difference between the meals in terms of glycemic levels two hours after the meal, which was an unexpected result. We would expect the, the, gly the glycemic levels to be higher after the potatoes compared with rice. Um, but this has not been shown. There was no difference between the meals two hours after the meal. Uh, in terms of insulin response, higher insulin levels uh, were observed after pre-cooked and cooled potatoes. So if you're a diabetic who struggles with postprandial high glucose levels, this might be a, a good method for you. You may pre-cook your potatoes, cool them down, and then uh, heat them up again before you eat them. Uh, and there was a lower glycemic response after potatoes at night compared with rice. 
and the lowest um, glycemic response was observed after roasted potatoes. So if you're a diabetic who struggles with a lot high glycemic response at night, um, you know, potato, a potato dish um, for, for dinner might be preferable over rice and roasted potatoes might be the best. So it really, um, you know, also shows um, that different conditions may uh, require different cooking methods. But overall, the study has clearly shown that potatoes, um, you know, seem to be beneficial for, for type 2 diabetes. That's uh, really interesting to me. And so let's let's talk about this a, a little bit more here. The one thing that, that stood out to me is we're talking about roasted potatoes uh, and, and boiled potatoes and then cooled potatoes. Nowhere on there did uh, I see anything like potato chips or fried potatoes or French fries. I think that had those foods been a part of this study, we would have seen completely different results. Absolutely. I completely agree. And most of the, sadly, most of the potato consumption in the U.S. comes from potato chips and french fries. And this is not what we recommend here. This is not what the study is suggesting. Uh, so if we're looking at french fry and potato chip consumption, um, the recommendation is clear. We should not be consuming those foods or completely minimize those, those foods. We're looking into, uh, you know, cooked potatoes, roasted potatoes, um, and eventually pre-cooked and cooled down potatoes. Um, these are the cooking methods that they used in the study. Yeah, and, and along those lines, uh, you know, you can take broccoli. Broccoli is undisputedly a healthy food, but if you, you know, batter that and then deep fat fry it, that's not going to be a health food anymore either. I'll tell you another something interesting that I found in this study is right off of the bat in the introduction was that the researchers said that potato consumption had dropped by 20% in, I believe, Australia and Europe, and I suspect other parts of the world as well, because we have turned into such a carb-phobic society that people just, regardless of whether we're talking about blood sugar or other reasons, they're just like, carbs are the devil, I can't eat carbs. And so potatoes fall into that category as well. When in reality, they are one of the most nutritious foods out there on the planet. Absolutely. Potatoes uh, contain a lot of fiber. The fiber content was two times higher uh, in the potato dishes in this study compared with the rice dishes. Uh, potatoes are super high in fiber. They're high in vitamin C and potassium. They're low in sodium. Uh, and, you know, people have been surviving on potatoes for, for so many years, uh, even during uh, the world wars. People were surviving on potatoes mainly. And uh, they were doing well, actually. The cardiovascular disease, um, you know, went down during world war when people were eating potatoes. Uh, so they're definitely a nutritious food, uh, high in fiber, high in vitamin C. Uh, and there's no reason to avoid them. Yeah, very easy to cook and, and very affordable as well. If you're looking to stretch that dollar, potatoes are another great option there too. So nothing but upside when it comes to spuds, Dr. Kaliofa. <laughs> yeah, one of the staple foods, really. Uh, you know, one of the cheapest foods you can, you can get. Um, Absolutely. I love it when you come on the show. I tell you this every time. You always bring the most fascinating research to us. So thank you. You've done it again. Yeah, thank you so much, Chuck. And I hope you will have some potatoes for lunch or dinner today. Oh, it's a fact. You can count on that. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And with the wonders of technology, we are back live. So isn't that something, right? Potatoes for diabetes, white potatoes for diabetes. Kind of getting that uh, a second look now. Dr. Hanna Kaliova, always with the interesting research. I bet there's a pretty good chance that next week, one week from today at Thanksgiving, there will be potatoes on your table. Maybe sweet, maybe white, I don't know, but I hope that they are delicious. But right now, let's continue 
our look at Thanksgiving. You know, yesterday we talked about specific dishes, some turkey alternatives when we had Maggie Neola on the show. Wonderful dietitian. Well, today I wanted to bring on a doctor and get the doctor's perspective. And for that, I wanted to welcome Dr. Vanita Rahman to the exam room live. And Dr. Rahman, I don't want to necessarily talk menu today. I want to talk about bigger picture when it comes to Thanksgiving, because when you think Thanksgiving, you think about overstuffing yourself, can't zip up your pants, got to unbutton the top and just take a food coma ultra nap. So let's talk practical tips for people who don't want to begin that holiday weight gain next Thursday at Thanksgiving. So how can we keep it healthy? How can we keep ourselves from overindulging at the table next week? Yeah, such an important topic, Chuck. You know, uh, I, it's hard to believe, first of all, that Thanksgiving is a week from today with the kind of very strange year that we've had. But the key to a successful Thanksgiving is really just planning ahead. You know, like when you go on a journey, you look at the map, you figure out how long it'll take you, you fill up the gas tank. So we kind of need to do the same thing with our Thanksgiving meal. Let's plan, plan, plan. That's the key. And planning not only what we're going to eat, but how we're going to eat it, how much we'll eat so that we're not caught off guard and feeling overly stuffed, needing to unzip our pants and just feeling terrible about it. So here are some tips that I have. Uh, first of all, uh, prepare a healthy plant-based meal as Maggie discussed earlier. And there are so many great recipes on the internet, great recipes on our website. And you know what's important to remember is we don't necessarily crave specific food. It's we crave flavor. So if you crave uh, a potato dish, think of the flavor you're craving and then whip up those potatoes in a healthy way so that you're satisfied. Now, the other thing is, um, you know, watching what we eat, how much we eat. So a couple of tips here. Uh, it's really easy to overeat on Thanksgiving. So one thing that I like to do is keep my serving platters away from the table. Although we all like this beautiful Thanksgiving table, but then when we sit around it, it's so easy to just keep dipping and getting more and more because we're enjoying the time so much. So just keeping it even a few feet away at a different counter or in the kitchen while we sit in the dining room can drastically impact how much we're eating. And, uh, and if you're really worried about over consuming and you know it'll be tempting, then maybe instead of pulling out those big dinner size plates, pull out the salad size plate, make them the entree plates uh, or the, the plates that we're eating from and use the dinner plates as entree plates instead. It sounds kind of crazy, but What's now the salad size plate used to be our dinner plates many, many decades ago, but for some reason, everything shifted. So some of these tips can make a big difference. Uh, you know, it's so fun. When I was starting to lose weight and I switched to the smaller plate, it was completely psychological. I still looked down. I still saw that full plate. And I was like, man, you know, it is time to chow down. I'm going to feel so full after this. But if you put that same portion on that bigger plate that most of us are <laughs> using these days, it's like, well, where's the rest of the food, right? So it's it's a mind game, but it absolutely works so well. I, you know, this year is kind of wonky. We don't know how many people are going to be traveling to be mm -hmm. with their family this year because of the pandemic, unfortunately. But, you know, if somebody does, a lot of times in families, there's that one aunt, that one uncle, that one cousin, whomever, who pressures you eat more and more and more. You know, if it's on your plate, you got to eat it. And that plate needs to be piled a mile high. How do you deal with that kind of pressure? Yeah, good question. You know, I, I know I get that all the time from my family. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's very tough because someone may have gone through great lengths to prepare this meal for us and they're really excited. And then we don't want to disappoint them or feel like we're being ungrateful. Uh, so several things you can do. You can say, you know, I'm pacing myself. This is just my first round. And in a little bit, I'm going to have a second round or, um, I'm, I'm really working to lower my blood sugars. And I found if I just eat like this and then get seconds later, that just works much better for me. Or say that, you know, I love your cooking so much. I'm planning to pack some and take some home with me because I know I will want some again later. So just really kind of being firm, but polite and, 
and just showing our appreciation and gratitude, but also sort of setting our boundaries is so important. You know, and that gets me to thinking about in my family growing up, we always ate at such a weird time. Like it was literally <laughs> in the middle of the afternoon, like yeah. 3 30. And it was like, it's too late to be lunch. It's too early to be dinner. Why in the world are we eating right now? It doesn't make a whole lick of sense. So if you're talking about spreading out the meals, I would think that if you do eat closer to regular lunchtime at noon or one o'clock, then you would be ready for seconds. But the seconds would actually then be dinner four, five, six hours later later, I think that that would be a good solution here. I uh, exactly that's, you know, because now you've sort of taken care of two problems in with one um, action, you have prevented yourself from overeating at your Thanksgiving meal, and you don't have to plan for dinner, it's all ready for you. So uh, you can still enjoy your food. But instead of eating so much in one meal, we will be splitting it up across two meals. Have you given any thought to what it is that you're going to be eating this Thanksgiving? Do you know how much time you're going to be spending in the kitchen getting everything ready? Yeah. So I, uh, my teenage daughter has offered to make our Thanksgiving meal for us. So Say I, it isn't so. Yes. So uh, wow. I'm going to be uh, having a relaxing Thanksgiving and she's a great chef and really looking forward to all that she whips up. Oh, that's fantastic. Did, is she sharing the menu or is this being kept top secret under wraps classified for your eyes only? Uh, a little bit of both. I'm being consulted, but it's being made very clear. It's not my decision, which <laughs> is fine. I'm happy to be the guest and enjoy the food. All right, real quick, as long as we're talking about not overindulging, Thanksgiving obviously synonymous with pies and sweets. So if you do have a sweet tooth and you're just naturally inclined to go that route and have a huge slice of pumpkin pie or apple pie with ice cream, that a la mode, you know, how mm -hmm. can we really kind of take a step back and, and make sure that we don't go crazy when it comes to the sweets as well? Yeah, this is so important because, you know, I, I've been at many Thanksgiving dinners or lunches, whatever we want to call it, where there are four or five different types of pies and different ice creams. And I feel like trying it all. And by the time I try, I'm really stuffed. So, yeah, you know, um, I think something to keep in mind is too often when we're reaching for that dessert, we're thinking of how great it feels when we put it in our mouth, when we taste it, um, as we eat it and how wonderful we feel. Um, but maybe we should also be mindful of how we feel 10 minutes after that or half an hour after that or a few hours after that. So really being aware of that, you know, that I know how I feel while I'm eating it. But let me also think about how I'll feel a few hours later. Will my stomach hurt? Will my blood sugars go up? Will my blood pressure go up? Will I just feel bad, physically bad or emotionally bad. And just being mindful of all aspects of that experience can really make a big difference. And that way, we're taking that into account when we make that decision about how much pie to eat. Let's just be realists, though, about this, right? We know what we're going to feel like after we overeat, yet somehow every single year we <laughs> just say, it's worth it. I'm going to go all in on this meal anyway, and whatever happens, happens. Why do you think we're wired that way? I know that this is a really deep conversation, but it's almost celebrated to gorge on Thanksgiving to the point where it is painful. Like I would think that we're going to have to do some serious rewiring as a culture to get mm -hmm. this idea you know, off of the table. Yeah, well, I think you hit something right there. Uh, it's definitely cultural. It's been ingrained in us from the beginning. Thanksgiving is the time to just splurge and, and throw caution to the wind, just eat as much as we want. It's okay. It's, it's somehow that meal doesn't count, if you will. Uh, so there is that huge cultural shift that needs to happen. But the other part of it is physiological. You know, nobody really overeats the broccoli or cauliflower or, or the tofurkey on Thanksgiving. It's usually the dessert or the more rich fatty foods. So that gets back to, you know, what makes food so addictive. And it's usually the fat, the sugar, the salt in it. So when you have this pie, you've got the perfect storm of salt. Yes, desserts have a fair amount of salt in them, sugar and fat. And it just releases these neurotransmitters in our brain that make us happy. And we want to hold on to that feeling. So we keep eating more and more. So some of that is physiology and some of it is cultural. It's both. 
All right, and and let's just nerd out about nutrition here for a second. So <laughs> we're we're aware of how we feel, right? But what about metabolically speaking? So if we eat this huge, enormous meal that's just loaded with fat, loaded with calories, what is actually happening to us inside the body? Yeah, so uh, several things could be happening. Let's say the meal is high in sodium. Uh, we will immediately start retaining water. We will drink more. We will void less water and our blood pressure will rise, you know, and the next day it will show up on the scale. That water retention shows up almost overnight. So it wouldn't be uncommon to weigh a few pounds more. Uh, the other thing that can happen is if it's a high fat meal and someone has prediabetes or diabetes, they may notice their blood sugars rise two hours after the meal or the morning after that their sugar levels are significantly higher than they normally are. The other change that could happen is if the meal is high in saturated fat or if it has any kind of animal-based products which will invariably contain cholesterol, this can impact our cholesterol levels. Those levels are going up as, uh, as we're ingesting this food. So all of these changes can be rather immediate. Uh, they don't necessarily show up days or weeks later. They can happen as we're ingesting and definitely overnight we can see the difference. All right. Now let's uh, go ahead and open up that doctor's mailbag. We have a couple of questions that I want to get to today. Well, one is actually a follow-up to what Dr. Kaliova and I were discussing earlier in the show. This is a question from Elaine, Dr. Ramon. She wants to know, in your opinion as a doctor, which is better, a sweet potato or a white potato? Oh, well, that's, you know, both are great. In terms of nutrition and health, both are terrific. As uh, Dr. Kaliova just showed us from the research, uh, white potatoes are, are not likely to raise our blood sugar any more than white rice, so they're healthy for us. The, the key is how we're eating them. Uh, so avoiding oils, avoiding high fat toppings, avoiding frying them, avoiding the cheese on them. It's not the potato, it's what we do with it that matters. So However you like it, enjoy it, and get a wide variety of them. All right. And the next question, this is an interesting one. This is one that Roger sent in. He wants to know, do complex carbs raise or lower cholesterol? Do carbs really play a role with cholesterol? Yeah. So this has been a bit of a tricky question, a little bit controversial. So there are two types of carbohydrates, complex and simple. Simple are things like added sugars or refined grains, whereas complex carbohydrates are things like fiber or starchy molecules. Now, the, the majority of the research shows that we should stick with complex carbohydrates like fruits, vegetables, as opposed to fruit juice or vegetable juice, uh, with whole grains as opposed to refined grains. So, and, and we know from research uh, that has been done um, across many institutions that eating complex carbohydrates uh, leads to lower A1C levels, lower cholesterol levels, lower body weight. So they are healthy for us. Uh, the problem comes in when someone is eating predominantly refined carbohydrates like added sugars or fruit juices or sodas. Uh, those uh, can lead to weight gain, which could then lead to increases in cholesterol too. So it's best to stay away from those. But sticking with the complex carbohydrates, definitely the way to go. All right. Now, if somebody wants to make an appointment to visit with you at the Barnard Medical Center, I know that a number of exam roomies have already scheduled appointments <laughs> to visit with you. And I think that actually, Dr. Rahman, this time of year would be a great time to get started and sit down and map your healthier journey. Get a jump start. While everybody else is going to be taking charge of their health come January 1st, why not get going now so you don't gain that traditional holiday weight? Why mm -hmm. not go ahead and make that appointment? You can help them out right now. All you need to do if you want to make an appointment to visit with Dr. Rahman is go to barnardmedical.org or you can call 202-527-7500, schedule an appointment that way. I know that you are licensed in a slew of states. Obviously, BMC covers more than a quarter of the country. So if somebody's watching you from Texas, I believe you can meet with them. Where else are you licensed? Oh, gosh. So I, I try to do it geographically. So uh, Texas, California, Florida, Georgia, Illinois, uh, DC, Maryland, Virginia, New York, Pennsylvania. I think I got that should be 11 states now. Well, when you set out to be a doctor, did you <laughs> say, I want to practice in 11 states? No, and I, I couldn't have imagined one day I would be seeing people across states through telehealth. But 
it's just a wonderful technology that we have and you know we're able to provide such good care through telehealth and it's it's really been a game changer i think in so many ways that's so awesome. All right. So all you need to do is visit barnardmedical.org or call 202-527-7500 to schedule that appointment today. Dr. Rahman, we will talk to you again next week. We're going to speak with you, I believe, on Tuesday, just in time for Thanksgiving. So thank you very much for taking the time today. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you, Chuck. All right. If we didn't get to your question today for the doctor's mailbag, I promise you we will save it and do our best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. And before we get out of here today, oh my goodness gracious, if you have not yet subscribed to the Exam Room podcast over on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, wherever podcasts are available, you need to go look for the Exam Room by the Physicians Committee, one of the top-ranked nutrition podcasts out there today. Well, there is a new episode out today, one that's called Blind Guy his wife, their vegan life. This is the story of Corey and Laquita Staten from Southern Virginia, and they are absolute characters. Corey actually lost his sight when he was just 19 years old. And so now here we are 20 plus years later, he's starting to have a number of other health complications, and he didn't want things to progress so dramatically that he couldn't go back. So his wife, the nurse, they're working together, got him on a plant-based diet, working on his blood pressure, working on his diabetes, working on a number of things. And through their new YouTube show, they're also singing the praises of a plant-based diet, encouraging others to follow suit. And in just a matter of months, his health is taking a dramatic turn for the better. So you got to check out this interview. And oh, by the way, these two are characters in the best way. I love Corey and Laquita Marie because... I mean, they talk about some of the silly adventures that they have for their YouTube show, including Corey getting behind the wheel of a car. I'm not making you, I'm not making this up. So check out that episode, become inspired and get ready to laugh. That's over on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever shows are available. Just look for the exam room podcast by the Physicians Committee. Hit that subscribe button and leave a five-star rating. But for this show today, that, my friend, is all the time that we have. I want to say thank you once again to Drs. Benita Rahman and Hanna Kaliova for taking the time to join us today and to the crew behind the scenes that makes the magic happen. Thank you guys, as always. And to you, exam roomies, thank you for tuning in and raising your nutrition IQs right alongside with us. On behalf of everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We'll talk to you again tomorrow. But until then, stay safe, take a stand, and... Keep it plant-based.